The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Common Pediatric Respiratory Problems by Dr. Monica Kleinman. Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Hello, my name is Monica Kleinman. I'm an attending physician in the Medical Surgical Intensive Care Unit at Children's Hospital of Boston. And today I'm going to be talking to you about common respiratory problems that children can present with. Upper airway obstruction. Two of the most common respiratory problems that children can present with are upper and lower airway obstruction. Now there's a whole set of uh, conditions that can result in upper airway obstruction, but what they all have in common is typically some edema of the soft tissues of the upper airway, um, either in the subglottic region uh, below the vocal cords or in the soft tissues above that, such as the epiglottis or hypopharynx. When you have obstruction in the upper airway, you'll demonstrate increased work of breathing because you're trying to use your muscles to draw in air against a higher resistance than normal, uh, remembering that the pediatric airway is already fairly small in caliber. With upper airway obstruction, you'll typically see suprasternal retractions or potentially sternal retractions as well in a young infant with a compliant sternum. And there's a characteristic noise that may accompany this called strider. And strider is a high-pitched noise that occurs on inspiration and is uh, the, the noise essentially of the turbulent airflow that uh, the infant is generating by drawing air in through a narrowed area. If the infant has obstruction at a higher level, for instance, uh, swelling of the tongue or uh, excessive uh, secretions or poor muscle tone resulting in hypopharyngeal obstruction, uh, the sounds that may be produced are much coarser, uh, sounds that are called uh, stertor, for instance, which sounds more like a snoring or a rattling type of respiration. Um, this can be e easily distinguished from strider if the baby responds to a jaw thrust maneuver where when you relieve the upper airway obstruction, from soft tissue, the noise improves. Subglottic edema won't have that same characteristic and needs other forms of treatment, uh, such as inhaled therapy with racemic epinephrine. Upper airway obstruction is, is clearly uh, one of the most dramatic presentations that uh, a child can appear with and can be very frightening to the child, the family, and the provider. Uh, it is important to recognize a, a couple of types of upper airway obstruction that require uh, urgent and specific management. Um, and one of those is epiglottitis. Now we already talked about uh, subglottic edema. Subglottic edema is the characteristic finding in croup where one has uh, inspiratory strider and a barking type of cough associated with upper respiratory infection symptoms and low-grade fever. <coughs> Epiglottitis presents typically in a more fulminant way where a, a child is well in the morning and by afternoon it has a high fever, appears toxic, and develops significant signs of upper, upper airway obstruction uh, that include perhaps some noisiness on inspiration because of the soft tissue swelling of the epiglottis and the surrounding tissues. Uh, but is also characterized by the child's refusal to speak or swallow because of the pain that they have in their throat. And those children will typically be drooling. If they are able to verbalize at all, they have what's described as a, a hot potato voice where they're talking as though they're 
mouth is containing something extremely hot that alters their speech pattern. And they may adopt a characteristic position that's designed to elongate and help open the upper airway, which is called tripoding. And in tripoding, the child sits with the arms forward, leaning forward with the neck extended in an effort to further open the airway. Epiglottitis can rapidly progress to complete airway obstruction and cardiac arrest. And so it's essential if you see this pattern to very early on obtain expert airway help, typically from uh, someone with training and experience in anesthesia uh, and possibly someone with the capability to do a surgical airway, like a, an emergency tracheostomy in the event that the patient cannot be intubated. These children are also very anxious and stressing them further could precipitate worsening obstruction. And so in most cases, it's best to avoid um, other forms of stress, such as starting IVs or uh, trying to position them in a way that, uh, that you would like. Let them stay in the position they want to be with family members while you gather your expert team. Lower airway obstruction. Lower airway obstruction uh, is characterized by wheezing which can sometimes be heard without a stethoscope, but is more characteristically heard on auscultation. And with lower airway obstruction, you have delayed emptying of lung units, typically from high resistance in the lower airways, which may be caused by infection, bronchospasm, uh, reaction to an allergen, or some other type of hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, that leads to narrowing of the airways that are inside the chest as opposed to outside the chest. These infants also have a forced expiratory phase and may demonstrate seesaw type of respirations. And characteristically, when you listen, you will hear a prolonged expiratory phase uh, where there may still be sounds of uh, wheezing and exhalation almost up until the time the baby takes another breath. These patients still breathe fast, even though by slowing down their respiratory rate, they might allow more time for exhalation and have less air trapping. But again, when you have poor lung compliance, which occurs at high lung volumes, the baby's most efficient way to compensate is gonna to be to breathe quickly. Uh, and so an infant, even one with very significant wheezing, is still likely to be tachypnic as opposed to uh, having a slower respiratory rate. Pneumothorax. Uh, finally, I want to talk about um, an unusual condition, but one that, again, has a characteristic pattern in an infant, and that is a situation of pneumothorax. Pneumothorax occurs when there's air in the pleural space between the lung and the chest wall. In an infant, the most common time we would see a pneumothorax would typically be as a result of a, a pulmonary infection um, and mechanical ventilation, where there would be some sort of uh, inflammation of the lung and applied trauma to the lung in the form of air under pressure that could result in leakage of air out of the lung parenchyma. This can sometimes be spontaneously seen in certain lung diseases like pneumocystis um, or in certain pneumonias where there's a particular necrotizing pattern such as methicillin-resistant staph aureus pneumonia. It can be the result of trauma. And so a patient who has sustained a chest injury may suffer a pneumothorax because of uh, increased pressure applied to the, the focal area of the lung that essentially erupts and releases air into the pleural space. Now pneumothorax may lead to asymmetry of the chest rise and asymmetric breath sounds. One of the reasons it's important to auscultate laterally on an infant is that there can be transmission of breath sounds if one only listens apically. And to hear true asymmetry, you want to get as lateral as you can. You may also observe differential chest rise, but the real hallmark 
if the pneumothorax is continuing to accumulate is that there will be air under pressure in the chest known as a tension pneumothorax. And when that occurs, the in will, infant will fairly rapidly deteriorate with not just respiratory distress, but inadequate cardiac output. And so there will be signs of venous congestion, like distended neck veins, because blood has trouble getting into the chest, and then hypotension and poor perfusion because the heart isn't filling and therefore not ejecting. So a tension pneumothorax is a true emergency that has to be treated with decompression of the pleural space. But recognizing it early may help you to treat it in a more controlled fashion uh, and also prevent the progression to cardiac arrest. That concludes our video on common pediatric respiratory problems. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.